Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. There's a new book out. It's called Invisible Americans, The Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. It's an alarming book. And in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's more alarming still. The author and my guest is Jeff Madrick. He's an economist, a brilliant journalist, and a senior uh, fellow at the Century Foundation. Jeff, um, thanks for um, doing this and joining us remotely. I My appreciate pleasure, it. Bob. Good to see you. Uh, uh, congratulations on your book. Uh, it's a, a stunning read. It is not a fun read, but I think it's an important read. Uh, as you point out in the in the book, and I don't know how many people realize this, that um, among um, large wealthy nations, the United States has the highest child poverty rate um, in the world. Uh, why is that? We're such a wealthy country, or at least until this uh, economic crisis associated with the pandemic, we were such a wealthy country. Why such a high child poverty rate? Well, the beginning is that we have high inequality. At the low end of the spectrum, workers do not make much money. But the main issue is a simple one. We do not have the same level of social support that other wealthy, large nations have. We just don't support kids and their parents the way other nations do. The, uh, how many children are poor um, in, in America? And, 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 and uh, if you can, give us a sense of what their daily lives are like. Well, at least 13 million children are officially poor. That's a heck of a lot of children. I'd argue the number is higher. I'd argue the number is closer to 22 million if we really measured poverty correctly. And the current official measures simply don't do that. Uh, the lives of, lives of these children are very hard. And I think Americans don't even believe there are many poor children in the nation. They have psychological issues. They're pessimistic. But most important, I think, there's a mountain of evidence that shows that cognitively and emotionally they suffer compared to other children, and even their brain architecture is affected by poverty. Uh, and when that sort of thing uh, is the case, um, it has to mean that, that, that the poverty that they experience in childhood affects them throughout their lives, doesn't it? It does indeed. The measures of wages as they get older, their wages are lower. They, they, uh, they are incarcerated more often. In high school years, they or have higher dropout rates, they attend college less. All these problems continue to, uh, to follow them. Uh, tell me what you mean when you say uh, you don't think um, that the number of children in poverty is correctly measured. I don't think generally, Bob, poverty overall is measured correctly. The poverty measure was created in the 60s based on a food budget. It has not been changed. The only thing that has been changed is inflation. It's been in adjusted for the inflation rate. Even Milton Friedman's wife, an eco a conservative economist named Rose Friedman said, you have to adjust these poverty measures every five and at worst 10 years. And virtually all serious economists agree with that. So when the poverty measure was created, it came to about half or 50% of median family income, that is typical family income. It now comes to about 30% of typical family income. It's much too low, there are more poor kids. Um, and then um, talk about, so, so if, the, if the reality of the number of poor children is higher than the official statistics uh, would show, what about the, uh, there's an awful lot of people who are, families who are just above the poverty rate, the so-called near poor, I, th I think they're referred to. Um, so what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Do, do you know? 
Yeah, sure. I think it's, as I said earlier, I think if we had a full measure, it would be closer to 22 million kids. I think the poverty rate should be about one and a half times the official poverty rate and arguably almost two times the official poverty rate. So we're talking about a heck of a lot more kids. And you raise a very good point, Bob. Just because the poverty rate, let's say it's about $27,000 a year for a family of four, two adults, two children, that doesn't mean all poor people are earning $27,000 a year. A lot of people earn much less than that. Right. And that too, that too is far worse than it is in other industrial countries. The number below is much larger than just the top at the top line than in other uh, major nations. You referred in your book to what you uh, call the, a mean-spirited a mean and destructive prejudice against the poor uh, in this country. Uh, that, that's a, a strong uh, statement. It is not one that I disagree with, but tell me what you meant yeah. by it. Well, it, uh, it's not new, as you know. America has always been skeptical of the poor. It's an Anglo tradition. The British were skeptical of the poor as well. Uh, we generally have a national character su that suggests fallaciously that anybody can make it. We're all born equal. Uh, it's simply not true. And Amer many Americans blame the poor for being poor. It's their responsibility. In fact, social uh, spending and social programs are necessary to give people truly equal opportunity. These poor kids really suffer major disadvantages. And of course, uh, it would seem to me that a, um, uh, a big contributor uh, to, to this idea of how the poor are viewed in this country, uh, you go into in some detail in your book, you talk about the distinction uh, between folks who, who view poverty as an issue that has to do with the behavior of people who are poor or families uh, that are, are poor and those who believe that uh, the primary responsibility uh, falls with uh, structural or, or uh, political issues. Can you talk about that distinction? There are people who believe uh, the poor are lazy, that they have lower IQs. Much of this is associated with unsupportable racist attitudes, some of them fomented by famous, as you know, uh, um, uh, authors, uh, commercial authors. Right. Um, Charles Murray is a standout. Yep. in that group, 1980s and 1990s. Uh, I think that uh, we have, uh, uh, there is, let me just go, I, I'm hesitating because I'm wondering if I should go into this. But then there's this group that believes there's a sort of culture of poverty. Right. The culture itself breeds laziness. Well, that's probably slightly true, but interestingly, many progressives climbed aboard that bandwagon in the 1980s and 1990s, well-known ones, and claimed there's a subculture there that promotes uh, distaste for work, laziness, lack of attention span. It's mostly baloney. The real issue is these people don't have opportunities, they don't have jobs, they have very bad environments that include uh, lead poisoning, for example, yeah. and very bad schools at the start of their lives. Terrible housing is, is an issue. Big yeah. issue, evictions. Improper health care or lack Inad of health care. Lack of health care or inadequate health care, even when they have insurance. We've made improvements there, but it's still inadequate. And of course, if you uh, blame the poor for their condition, then uh, you absolve yourself and there's no obligation as a society. There's no obligation to the rest of us to take the steps necessary that would alleviate that poverty. That's the, uh, that's the point. It's not our fault. Let's not help them. And worse than that, helping them, as you remember in the 80s and 90s in particular, helping them was supposed to cause welfare, not correct welfare, cause oh, poverty. This culture of dependence, if you, if you gave them a helping hand, they would become dependent upon it and would be even more reluctant to work. Exactly. The dependency issue is one of the great key words in the dam most damaging aspects of our history. Well, we have the highest child poverty rate among large wealthy nations. What is it that other countries are doing uh, that we're not doing? Why do they have lower rates? Well, as I mentioned earlier, social policies are 
the main issue. What are social policies? They actually give almost every child, they give the parents of almost every child a monthly stipend, cash. They have far better uh, home leave programs. They have far better child care programs and early education programs. They have better health programs for mothers. Uh, I think I said they have uh, substantial working leave programs for mothers or fathers, if fathers prefer it. The, right. the social net in these nations is dramatically more ample and adequate and civilized, I might say. And so you touch on what is uh, actually a cornerstone of your book when you mention this monthly stipend. Uh, you think, uh, and it, it's, it's such a, a simple idea, uh, you think that the way to help the poor and to help poor children uh, especially is to, in fact, what they lack is money. They, they, they don't have funds. Uh, you think that, they, that we need to provide the money for them to spend to help lift them out of poverty. Tell us about that proposal and how it would work. Here's the reason I believe that, because there is now a mountain of evidence developed by very serious, intense scholars in the last 20 years that show that money really matters. One uh, illustrative example, a famous one, were the Cherokee Indians who started a casino. I think it was North Carolina. They give, gave $5,000 to every family who had kids per child. And then the results were measured. These kids finished high school and had much better cognitive futures and better emotional futures than the children who did not get those to get that money. There are countless natural experiments like that that show money really made the difference. Money alone. Obviously, there are other issues, whether right. parents went, got educated, for example, whether there's alcoholism in the family. Right. But money stands out in these many social in these many so-called natural experiments and some actual experiments. It's fascinating. Uh, uh, the London School of Economics poured through all these studies to, f to find out, to, to uncover the ones that measured this most clearly, most independently. What studies looked at cash and separated all the other issues that can affect the outcomes for children? And they found, uh, a large number of them showed that money was the main issue. So my proposal is let's give them money. The second aspect of that is let's stop being paternalistic and telling them what they should do with this money. Let's have some faith in the poor. They love their kids. And third, there's evidence those cash allowances, Bob, work in Europe and in Canada where they're tried without conditions. You don't, right. you don't, you're not saying, we'll give you this money if your kid goes to school, if he, goes, he or she goes to the dentist and so forth. We're giving it to you because we believe you will spend it best for them on, nourish, on books, on a nourishing environment, a calm environment, a non-stressful environment, on and on. Uh, you point out in the book that in those uh, uh, cases uh, where a monthly stipend or a stipend of some sort has been uh, provided for families, the families have in fact spent that money on the critical needs of their kids, haven't they? There am, there's ample evidence in Europe that that's been the case. There's evidence in the U.S. when we've had uh, somewhat similar programs that the money gets spent on the kids. Uh, we've got to get over this idea that parents always want to take advantage of their children. They, poor parents actually also love their children. So how much money are we talking about? How much money would... Um, uh, ideally families get, and then uh, how would it be paid for, and, and how much would it, would it cost the government? Well, when I started looking into this and started thinking about cash allowances uncondition without conditions, my original uh, concern was paternalism. My, the, uh, my other concern is increasingly there was proof money mattered. Now, a preponderance of serious academics also are recommending that. And they've done work measuring the cost of these programs. And the sort of program I would encourage is to say $300 to $400 a month, maybe $500 a month per child, would cost America, if we got rid of a couple of other uh, social programs, cost America only $100 billion. That is not a lot of money. It's easily affordable. 
We know that in these times when we're spending right. two trillion dollars to try and solve our, save ourselves from a depression. So uh, there's uh, very good support for the notion it's a hundred billion dollars. And as you and I discussed uh, one time before, child poverty is probably costing the, con the economy one trillion dollars in lost income right. and lost GDP. That means everybody, not just poor people, but all of us. A reduction in the GDP of one trillion dollars, remarkable. The reason is these kids are not educated well, they're not productive, then they get incarcerated, that's costly. They have more social welfare demands as we go on, unemployment, uh, food stamps and so forth. Um, uh, so really, let's be selfish. Let's save ourselves some GDP. So uh, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is actually an investment. It's not like um, you would provide a stipend for these families and it's just money uh, flushed down the, the, the drain. There's actually long term, as you point out for all of us, there's a return on that investment. Right, it's an investment exactly, and we can measure it. And it's especially important because these kids are doing so poorly. So the payoff will be especially high because they are so neglected. So as we all know, we're in the middle of a, a terrible economic crisis associated with the uh, pandemic. Uh, it doesn't take um, a genius to recognize that uh, poor families and poor children uh, will be severely impacted by this. So can you give us uh, a sense, um, you're an economist, uh, give us a sense of, of what you think is happening now uh, with poor families in the country and then uh, what the landscape uh, might look like as we move ahead. Well, I'm very worried. I think as many people have been saying, uh, this will lead to a depression. I'm more worried that we're already in a depression. That is a very harsh fall in the level of GDP, which is our national income, accompanied by a very rapid rise in the unemployment rate, and in fact, the poverty rate. So one of the ironies of our current situation is, many more Americans will now fall into levels that are considered officially poor. Many, many more will fall into levels that I think are poor. They will begin to see firsthand what the poor really live like. And we need significant government investment. Uh, we need government, uh, uh, the government should actually be paying the wages of people who lose money, but substantial increase Increases on unemployment, some of which we've had, unemployment insurance, some of which we've had are important. But we also have to think of the poor. A study recently by a scholarly group at Columbia suggests that the poverty rate could about double, double in the next, uh, in the next few months. And who will be hit worst? Children and adults of color will be hit worst. You, anticip you anticipated my next question. You already uh, touched on this a, a little bit. Um, but when we talk about poverty in, in this country uh, and uh, public policy with regard to poverty, uh, race is always a factor. I mean, um, I've been uh, covering this stuff for uh, more decades than I care uh, to remember. And whenever the issue of poverty comes up, uh, race comes up almost like hand in hand. Can you talk a little bit about um, the role that race plays when it comes to uh, poverty policy in this country? I think I, I devote a chapter to that, and I hope people will read that chapter, as many people as possible will read that chapter closely. It's hard to deny that America has become a racist country in the sense that they think black people are, choose your adjective, lazy, unintelligent, right. uncaring, simply doesn't hold up. The facts simply don't hold up. One of the, exam one of the good survey questions that I think reflects this is when people are asked what proportion of the poor are African-Americans, they say 50%. Right. That's the typical answer. It's 25%. There are more poor whites than there are blacks or Latinos. It's an example of the nature of this. So how does that affect our Poverty policy? Well, many Americans think blacks are the cause of their own poverty. 
right. they should be required to pull themselves up by the bootstrap, so to speak. A great American myth. That's partly been true for many Americans over many generations, but it's been true in environments that are conducive to opportunity for all, where there is a payoff. There has not been a payoff for the poor in this country for the, years. Um, you mentioned something called deep poverty uh, in, in your book. Um, these are um, uh, families that are uh, trying to get by on astonishingly low amounts of income. Can you talk a little bit about what deep poverty is and how many uh, children in our country are living in deep poverty? Um, academics came up with the term deep poverty to signify half that people are living below half of the poverty line. If the poverty line is $25,000, $27,000 for four, they're living at $13,000 a year. If it's $21,000 for a family of three, $10,000 a year, $11,000. When you consider an apartment, a decent apartment is probably $700 or $800 a month. That doesn't leave much money uh, left over. Uh, um, they do get food stamps. That's included in, in the current supplemental poverty measure. Uh, TANF, the, refer, the uh, welfare reform project, provides almost no money. It right. reaches only 20% of families compared to 60% before the re Clinton reforms of 1996. So uh, we're talking about serious deprivation here. Uh, how many, probably 4 million kids are in deep poverty. Part of the problem is how do you measure the darn poverty? Um, I would say it's three to four million. Another book by Paul Schaefer and Catherine Eden talked about families living on $2 a day cash, not including food stamps. They found a couple of million people in that category. Um, so we, we have a serious true poverty rate. And, and, uh, and, and it it's also shows up in hardship rates. You asked me earlier, how do the poor kids live? In my view, they are always hungry, or they are always thinking about whether they will be hungry. That's a pretty serious thing to say about 10, 15, 20% of children in America. My own reporting bears that out. I remember going around the country talking to uh, principals and school teachers, and one of the main things in, in poor neighborhoods that they felt that they had to do was to have snacks in the classroom for, for kids who, who came to school um, uh, hungry and then and made it that much more difficult uh, to pay attention and to learn in the classroom. I mean, um, you know, the subtitle of your book is The Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. And, and it is, in fact, a, a, a terrible tragedy that, that doesn't get uh, nearly enough attention. You mentioned um, TANF, which, of course, um, uh, is what came out of the so-called welfare reform uh, from the Bill Clinton administration back in the mid-1990s. Can you talk about what TANF is, what it has uh, done, and how it has worked out? Well, TANF established, uh, established work requirements. If a family in particular, it turned out to be mothers, wanted to get help from the federal government. That is, they had to go look for a job. And they, had to, and they had to get off the welfare rolls within five years. It now turns out, it's a somewhat complicated issue, but it now turns out that very little, very few families are receiving TANF money. Poor mothers I have spoken to said it's not really worth it to bother with all the paperwork, to get on a bus to go look for a job as often as you have to. Uh, because the, the payoff is so inconsequential. Better to try and get odd jobs around town. Uh, so it, it has been an a unsuccessful reform. It came out of that era when Bill Clinton famously said, the era of big government is over. Right. It made me particularly sad. I wrote a book called The Case for Big Government after that because of that. And uh, I think it's one of the great failures of social policy in America. But you know now, Bob, we've had many. We're just not, we're just turning our backs on the possibilities of being a decent, humane society. 
I agree. And uh, you were prescient uh, with that book. The era of big government, of course, is not over. It's just that the big government is not helping uh, the people who most need help um, uh, in this country. Um, you know, uh, it's funny. I was thinking about you being an economist and, um, you know, you go to school and kids want to be a, a, a doctor or a lawyer or an athlete or an artist or whatever. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to be an economist? Did you grow up thinking about the economy? Yeah, I kind of did. <laughs> yeah. but, but I never wanted to, it turns out in retrospect, I really didn't want to be an establishment economist. So uh, I actually wrote a book about this. You mean the book before this one called Seven Bad Ideas, How Mainstream Economists Damaged America. And I took, tried not to talk too much about myself, but I said I was always fascinated because I believe, I believe maybe more than I even should have. I, mean, I would call myself an economic determinist more than an economist. Um, the, uh, I believe economics de determines our lives, our opportunities, our happiness. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but um, this has been a, a really interesting uh, conversation. It's a uh, terrific book. It's called uh, Invisible Americans by Jeff um, Madrick. Uh, to our viewers, uh, thank you um, for tuning in. Uh, stay safe, and we'll see you again next time.